Hello, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the final installment of the Bow Valley Sustainable Building Summit. My name is Jody Conuel, and I am a program coordinator at the Biosphere Institute of the Bow Valley, and I will be your host today. Uh, before we get started, I wanted to just go over a few quick housekeeping notices. So as webinar attendees, uh, you will not be able to unmute your microphone without permission or turn on your video. Uh, however, we do, as always, welcome active participation at these events. Um, so if you have any questions for Dr. Tseng, please type them into the Q&A box accessible a lot using the bar along the bottom of your screen uh, as he goes through his presentation. Uh, there will be time for questions at the end and he will be answering all questions at the end of his presentation. Um, so in order that you don't forget your question, please do, do just type them in as, as you go along. Uh, if you experience any technical difficulties, please reach out to me using the chat function and I will do my best to help you. So as always, the Bow Valley Sustainable Building Summit has been brought to you today by the Biosphere Institute of the Bow Valley and the Bow Valley Builders and Developers Association. The Biosphere Institute is a local Camor based charity that aims to address what we believe are the two major challenges affecting the Bow Valley today. One of which is human wildlife coexistence and the other is climate change. Uh, we do so through targeted education, research and community engagement. Our local climate action efforts are managed under the Bow Valley Shift program, where we promote and empower local residents and businesses to reduce their energy emissions, waste production, and water use. The Bow Valley Builders and Developers Association, better known as BODA, is a membership-driven networking and advocacy group. BODA keeps its members up to date on issues impacting the industry and our community. BODA luncheons have become the premier monthly business networking event in the Bow Valley. Uh, the October luncheon is actually tomorrow and they will be hosting uh, one of our regular speakers, Dale Mickelson from University, uh, to close up uh, the Sustainable Building Summit. And he'll be zooming in from Whistler for that event. Um, so we're very grateful to the generous support of Energy Efficiency Alberta and the town of Canmore, uh, who helped fund this project. Um, back in 2019, the Biosphere Institute spent six months uh, talking to local business owners and developers asking them what they wanted to learn about energy efficiency and how they best wanted to learn it. Uh, the result was the Bow Valley Sustainable Building Summit. Um, unfortunately, due to the COVID-19 pandemic, the decision was made to cancel the original in-person event and take this learning online. And that brings us uh, all the way through here till today. Uh, so, Without much further ado, I'd like to introduce today's presenter, uh, Dr. Henry Tsang. Dr. Tsang is an award-winning architect, educator, and researcher on topics related to sustainable and resilient design. He is an assistant professor at the Royal Architectural Institute of Canada's Athabas Athabasca University and secretary of the Rakes Calgary Network. He completed his BSc architecture and masters of architecture at McGill University and his PhD at the University of Tokyo. He has been working closely with the Canada Green Building Council, preparing research reports and developing green building education material on building standards such as LEED, Living Building Challenge and WELL. And with that esteemed introduction, I would like you to hand you over to the man you all came to listen to today. Uh, please uh, begin your presentation, Dr. Stan. We're very excited to see it. Oh, I think you're on mute. Thank you, Jody. Thank you for the very generous um, introduction. I think that's the best introduction I've ever had. <laughs> uh, so here, uh, I just, I'm just going to pull up my slides quickly. Do you see that? Yes, all working fine. Thank you. Thank you very much. 
So um, welcome everyone uh, to this presentation. Uh, the title of this presentation is Designing for Climate Change and uh, an Architect's Responsibility. Um, I'm speaking to you on behalf of the RAAIC, which stands for the Royal Architectural Institute of Canada. Um, at Athabasca University, we have a Center for Architecture, which is an, a university program uh, teaching architecture uh, uh, online. And uh, I also represent the RAAIC Alberta chapter, in particular, the uh, Calgary Network. Um, for those of you who don't know uh, the REIC, the Royal Architectural Institute of Canada is a not-for-profit uh, national organi organization that has represented architects in architecture for over 100 years. Uh, it's been in existence since the 1907, and the REIC is the leading voice for excellence in the built environment in Canada, uh, demonstrating how design enhances the quality of life. Uh, while addressing important is issues of society through responsible architecture. The REAC's mission is the, to promote excellence in the built environment and to advocate for responsible architecture. Uh, the organization's national office is based in Ottawa, but with the federal uh, federated chapter model uh, with the chapters and networks in uh, British Columbia, Alberta, and Nova Scotia. The vision of the RAC is the leading voice for excellence in the built environment in Canada and demonstrating how design enhances uh, quality of life while addressing important issues uh, of society through responsible architecture, such as um, climate change. The RAC's mission is to promote excellence in the built environment and to advocate for responsible architecture and how architects can contribute to that. So I think um, today what I would like to talk to you is, is really a focus on how uh, architects can contribute to, um, to promote uh, meaningful actions towards uh, the fight uh, for, uh, towards climate change. Um, this is just a quick uh, map to show you uh, what the RAC, uh, RAC's organization looks like right now. Uh, the headquarters is in uh, Ottawa and we have um, chapters, like I said, uh, in several provinces of Canada. And since last year, uh, Alberta's chapter has been active with uh, networks in Calgary and Edmonton. Um, I also talked to you today uh, representing Athabasca University. Uh, um, first of all, I would like to mention that Athabasca University respects, respectfully acknowledges that we are on and work on traditional lands of indig indigenous peoples of Canada. Uh, First Nations, Métis, and Inuit, and we honor the ancestry, heritage, and, and gifts of the Indigenous people and give thanks to them. For those of you who don't know Athabasca University, um, it is a online open university in northern Alberta, about two hours north of Edmonton. Uh, if you see the map, you see that little uh, orange dot, uh, and that's where the university is. But being a virtual university, we have a campus in Calgary and Edmonton, and most of our students are uh, throughout Canada and globally. Um, I believe I see some familiar names in the, uh, in the participants list here, and I believe many of my students are here. <laughs> um, so we do offer a, a bachelor um, degree in architecture, and we are also working on graduate studies uh, program as well. So if any of you are interested in studying architecture virtually, we like to say that Athabasca, we've been teaching uh, architecture for about 10 years now, and we, we like to say that we're pandemic ready, um, and, and that recently with the COVID um, pandemic, we've been seeing a, a, a rise in students in our uh, curriculum. And, and we also like to say that we are an accessible program related to the REIC uh, syllabus program that provides um, an accessible uh, education program to uh, students who, um, in, part in particular, who don't live in uh, one of the major cities of Canada and, uh, for example, in Indigenous uh, regions to provide architectural education to those uh, regions. So before I go into my presentation, um, maybe Jody, you can pull up this, uh, the poll right now. 
Sure thing. Uh, so we just have a quick poll for you. Uh, we're interested to learn uh, who's on the line. Um, so it's one really quick question. So if you care to just take a moment and answer the question that's up on your screen now, we would really appreciate it. And this is not for attendance uh, students, so don't worry about uh, the answer for this one. Okay, but probably while uh, you're doing that, I'll talk about this a little bit. Um, October 5th, uh, two days ago, was uh, World Architecture Day. And I think it's very timely that we're giving this presentation today as we are still in this week where um, architects around the world are discussing about, well, what is um, the role of architecture and how architecture con contributes to um, bettering the, the built environment that we live and work in. Um, the World Architecture Day was celebrated on the first, is celebrated on the first Monday of every October and was set up by the Union Internationale des Architects, so the UIA, International Ar Architects Union, um, in 2005 to remind the world of its collective responsibility for the future of human habitat. And it coincid uh, co coincides with the UN Habitat World Habitat Day. So this was uh, originally the day where we uh, would um, discuss about how we can provide uh, housing and, and, and a decent place to live for um, people around the world. So here in this image you see in 2017, um, the year uh, we talked about climate change and action. So a lot of the resolutions and um, action plan that we had to develop in 2017. Uh, I'd like to talk about some of those today, but also since then we've, um, the architectural profession has somewhat aligned with um, the United Nations in terms of uh, its goals and objectives to reach um, uh, carbon and uh, energy um, targets. The results are in, if you would like me to share them uh, with everyone. Here we go. Uh, you can see we've got quite a lot of superheroes on the line, uh, which we like to see. Well, I, I do hear that there's a lot of um, residents and um, people who are just interested in uh, the topic of climate change, I guess that's uh, in relation to what you're doing at the Biosphere Institute. So I'm very, very happy to um, to talk about these issues with you. I speak today mainly from the lens of an architect and uh, what architecture uh, as a profession can contribute to um, uh, climate change action. Um, so if you have any questions related to uh, how we can collaborate, I think collaboration is probably the key um, that that will allow us to open up um, more uh, um, integrated solutions to how we can tackle these problems. So here you see, um, first of all, of course, everyone knows about global warming. And here you can see um, how it's evolved over the last 130, 40 years. And you can see where the red areas uh, are, are, is where the global warming is um, being affected the most. And mostly you can realize that it's mostly in the northern uh, uh, poles where the difference of temperature has increased the most. Here, uh, the red actually represents four Fahrenheit uh, of degree change. So that's about two degrees Celsius of change over the last 100 years. So looking at this, um, global warming is not a problem unless uh, it, it, you know, in Canada, we always say, well, we don't really mind having the, the temperature going a couple of degrees warmer, but it actually has a lot of consequences. And here in this graph, you see the uh, occurrences of natural disasters that have multiplied in the last 30 years um, and of course, a lot of this data comes from uh, insurance companies. Uh, for example, here in 198, from 1980 to 2014, you see that natural disaster uh, occurrences have tripled in the last 30 years. 
And here you see the breakdown as well of what kind, and um, it breaks down into geophysical events such as earthquakes, tsunamis, and volcanoes, uh, meteorological events such as storms, uh, hydrological events such as floods, and climatological events such as extreme temperatures like drought and forest fires. And this is especially timely since in the last couple of weeks, we've seen a lot of Jarrod and forest fires in Western Canada. And probably um, a lot of us are still kind of breathing the smoke from the, the fires in California. So this image I show because, well, this is probably one solution is if we are all ready to move to Mars, uh, that we wouldn't ha be having this conversation today. This is an image that was developed by Foster and Partner Architects, a, a firm that is based in the UK. And this is a rendering of what would uh, uh, buildings and uh, shelter look like if we were to build something on Mars. This image actually really reminds me some of, uh, uh, of some of the bad lines in uh, Alberta. So it's probably not too far uh, from that kind of reality. Um, here, a lot of you would be familiar with this graph as well, the United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC. And what you would notice here, of course, is um, we are always talking about the two degree uh, temperature change difference that we don't want to go beyond. Um, today we are in 2020. so right at the intersection where, where all of these different lines kind of start to diverge. So what this means is that in 2020, uh, we have a choice to either, um, you know, follow the curve, the red curve, that's uh, business as usual, if we keep everything as is, and we keep on going uh, business as usual, it will keep on going up uh, in the next uh, 300 years to about um, seven degrees and in increase. But of course, you can see all of the, the other uh, modeling. And recently, we've, because of the, the COVID pandemic, we, we are trying to plank the curve. Well, this is another curve that we should be trying to plank. Um, the one that we're trying to aim for, of course, is the RCP 2.6. Um, that's uh, really under the two degrees. And we're really aiming for the 1.5 degrees, if we could, so that we don't uh, diverge into um, some of the, uh, the situation where we can't control the temperature change anymore. So um, with architecture, we, the a lot of the targets we set in the building industry comes from COP21, the Paris Agreement. Um, and I just listed some of the takeaways from the Paris Agreement so that we are on board uh, on what we're talking about in terms of target. At Paris 2015, we talked about limiting global warming to two degrees or 1.5 degrees if possible, to attain net zero energy by 2030, to increase government and major construction firms leadership and improve interaction among the green building councils and encourage advocacy and training initiatives. So these are like the large uh, guidelines that were developed at, the, at COP21 and of course trickles into um, our architectural uh, councils uh, and building councils. And many of you, you of course know the SDGs um, and what I would just like to point out here is if you look at them closely many of them does um, relate to the uh, architectural and building uh, industry closely, such as uh, number nine that talks about indus industry, innovation, and infrastructure, or 11, the sustainable cities and communities. So a lot of what we do, you know, should also align with the SDGs and um, what we had listed um, right before. So bringing this uh, conversation to Canada, this is a report that was uh, published by the CAGBC. Um, here, there's three graphs uh, that kind of depict what's happening in Canada uh, right now in relation to uh, green building, green construction, and, and where we're kind of headed. On the left, uh, you have a graph that looks at the level of green building activity. 
So what you notice here is the increase of the dark greens. Uh, so which is how, uh, what is the percentage of green buildings being done in a, uh, an architecture firm or within the architectural industry? And we can see that it's slowly but surely increasing. So more and more clients or more and more firms are working on green projects, which is good. But if we remember that our target is net zero by 2030, well, we would need to have all of that in dark green uh, by that date. So we have about 10 years. And at this rate, we're not going to be uh, making that target. The second graph in the middle shows uh, sectors with planned green building activity over the next three years. So this I'm going to elaborate a little bit more uh, in my further slides. Um, but if you can see where the opportunities are in terms of green building, a lot of it is actually not being um, uh, developed yet. For example, here, if you look at existing buildings and retrofit, only half of the buildings that we're retrofitting right now are uh, green uh, construction, or even in new construction, uh, we're looking at about 40%. And if you notice Canada is the dark green bar and compared to the global, it's on par or even a little bit lower than what's happening globally and uh, significantly less than what's happening, happening in the US. The third graph on the right shows the top three triggers for increasing involvement in green building in Canada. So this is the reason why um, clients would uh, or clients or developers would want to engage in a green construction. And this is data from Canada. So a lot of it is mostly an ethical or more moral thing to do. Um, only 40% of the time, it's the client that demands it. Um, and the third line is municipal, federal, and green building policy. So if there's an incentive or not from the government or not, that also plays a factor in, in whether a green uh, project is uh, furthered or advanced or not. So today, um, with the learning outcomes that we had established for this course, I, I'd like to list out um, the things that we want to talk about uh, in today's lecture. Um, I'd like to talk about five issues um, that affect the AEC related to the climate change, the five issues that we should be tackling as architects. Um, then I'm going to talk about 17 resolutions that the REIC, the Royal, Ar Royal Architectural Institute of Canada, has come up with as a profession and how, how we should move on, uh, move forward as a profession related to the fight, uh, to the fight uh, against climate change. And then four um, defined actions that we can take as architects to, to, um, to also do the same. So climate change is issues affecting the AEC industry. So this is, in my opinion, um, the five topics we should really tackle on first. Um, number one, uh, carbon. Uh, number two, the issue of energy, which is um, demand for energy um, and, and the type of energy that we use. CO2 and energy, of course, are very closely related, and we'll talk a little bit about that. Number three is waste. Number four is uh, population. Number five is natural disasters. So CO2 and energy, of course, um, a lot of you have seen this before. Um, the building industry accounts for about 40% of the global CO2 emissions. So if you look at the orange and brown uh, parts of the pie chart, 28% um, comes from building operations and 11 comes from building materials and its construction. So this is where uh, we talk about CO2 emissions. But comparatively, we also have the energy used by sector, which is 41% building operations and 5.9% uh, building construction and material. So it's very similar numbers. It's about 40 to 50% uh, that relates to, arc, uh, to building. Um, but what we need to note here is that, well, if building accounts for about 40 to 50% of CO2 and energy, well, that's where we as 
uh, construction professionals can really contribute to. Imagine if all of that can be reduced um, in, 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 in relation to transportation and industry, um, that would be a, an, an amazing achievement. So when we talk about waste, um, construction waste accounts for about 25% of global waste. And that's a lot. And, I, and I, I did see a question that Jody had sent me um, from a, one of our um, participants related to um, deconstruction. So one ways to tackle waste is, well, can we think about ways that we can construct and deconstruct buildings so that we don't end up with um, uh, waste construction waste going to landfills? So this is a very important problem because like I said, this is this accounts for about 25% of our global waste. How we design our buildings, how can we recycle the materials is uh, a very important issue that we need to tackle. The third, uh, the fourth point that, the fourth issue that I had uh, listed was population. We have to realize that population is increasing in the world and the data shows that the population of the world will increase to about 10 billion uh, in 2050. So that's a, today we're about 6 billion. So it's almost doubling within the next 30 years. In terms of sustainability, well, how do we sustain um, the infrastructure of a city or um, make sure that we have the um, the housing to house everyone and this is the infrastructure to sustain a, um, a large number of new cities or mega cities that will be developed in the next three decades. So this is a, a, a problem in, ter in terms of sustainability because we don't have um, the resources in terms of uh, building resources. Um, for example, right now we're looking at a um, depletion of sand. So sand, of course, is the uh, product that we, uh, the resource that we need for making glass or windows and, and, and panels, you know. For example, how, if we don't have enough sand, how can we sustain for uh, a doubling of a population on, on the planet? So those kind of issues need to be addressed as well. And then lastly, natural disasters, as a consequence of climate change, um, natural disasters, of course, needs to be addressed. And architects have two ways of looking at it. One, to look at how we can prevent disasters to happen. And two, to design uh, or redesign cities and buildings after a disaster has actually happened. So I'm not going to go too much into natural disasters today because I know that this talk is not about uh, disaster architecture, but my, my background when I was living in Japan was to work on um, disaster architecture on several uh, projects that are related to uh, earthquakes and tsunamis in Japan. So um, I do have some projects I could show you at the end. If we look at natural disasters a little bit more, the map of natural disasters uh, and, and its occurrences, uh, of course, has to do with the geography of the place. Um, in Canada, we're quite lucky that we don't have that many uh, natural disasters, but you can imagine that if you're close to a shore or if you're an island country or if you're close to um, the ring of fire of volcanoes and earthquakes, then you'd be prone to a lot more uh, natural disasters. So I'm going to jump right into um, the resolutions. Um, so the REIC in 2019 came up with 17 resolutions on climate change. Um, I apologize in advance that this is a little bit dry because it's just 17 sentences, but I tried to boil it down to 17 keywords so that it's easily digestible. Um, the intent of this resolution is to provide a framework for REIC to prioritize and support urgent and sustained action in order for its members to design for holistic health, uh, resilience, and regenerative, regenerative built environment. 
So number one. So resolution number one talks about design. So it says, whereas the vision of the RAC is to be the leading voice uh, for excellence in the built environment in Canada, demonstrating how design enhances the quality of life while addressing important issues of society through responsible architecture. So it's a very broad kind of definition of what architects can do. And obviously if we had to boil down the role of the architect to one word, I would say it would be to design. You know, how can we design uh, meaningful architecture or architecture that creates a sense of community and enhances quality of life is I guess the main role and uh, one of the main uh, topics uh, for the REAC to address. Number, of, number two is to um, strive for excellence, meaning whereas the mission of the REAC is to promote excellence in the built environment and to advocate for responsible architecture. And excellence also means quality architecture, you know, high quality architecture that um, is responsive to the context, but also uh, responsive to the, um, the local community and the people that use it. Number three, uh, values, whereas the values of the RIC include integrity, environmental responsibility, inclusiveness, and effectiveness. So all of that, of course, relates to how we um, design buildings. Uh, it's important that we have a communication with a community, that we think about the environment as a whole, that we're inclusive, such as um, when we talk about accessibility, uh, universal design, for example, and in its effectiveness of its functions. Then, of course, um, the CAGBC is, uh, plays a very important role in Canada, the Canadian Green Building Council. But many of you don't know that the CAGBC in Canada was actually a committee that was uh, part of the REIC. In 2002, it was the Sustainable Buildings Canada Committee of the RAC. And uh, we today, we still keep a close relationship with the CAGBC and, of course, a lot of the, um, the standards uh, with related, uh, related to what green buildings are and how we define uh, green buildings uh, is mainly um, coming from the CAGBC. So um, many of you know uh, the LEED certification, the Living Building Certification, or um, Net Zero, Net Carbon, all of that is organized at the CAGBC, and also we produce a lot of the um, research and reports uh, there. So the, the RAC would like to continue to work with the CAGBC to define those. And of course, what a green building today is probably not the same as what it will be in 10 years or 20 years. The criteria for a green building are, are changing and evolving with um, the, the techniques and um, the rigorousness of what green buildings should be uh, today and in the future. Uh, zero carbon, whereas in 2014, the UIA uh, World Congress confirmed the Declaration 2050 imperative, which uh, recognizes that the architect's central role in planning and designing built environment uh, and the need to reduce carbon emissions to zero by 2050 and provide equal access to shelter and that the RAIC is a signatory to that declaration. So here it says 2050. Some at the UIA, it was established at 2050. At the uh, Paris um, Congress was 2030. So the dates kind of change, but I guess the, the target is the same that we need to uh, reach uh, zero carbon uh, in the next couple of decades. Cooperation, whereas in 2015, the Paris Agreement identified climate change as urgent and potentially irreversible threat to human societies and the planet, so the widest possible cooperation. So we're looking at cooperation between um, not just architects, but looking at cooperation that we can have with uh, government, municipalities, communities uh, across, across the board. Then 2030, uh, the challenge that we have is, whereas in 2007, the R RAC Board of Directors endorsed the 2030 challenge, which calls for new and renovated buildings to reach net zero operational emissions by 2030 and net zero embodied carbon by 2050. Okay, so this aligns with what we talked about before. 
Whereas in 2017, the RIC Board of Directors approved the creation of CORE, the Committee on, Committee on Regenerative Environments, and in 2015, the Indig Indigenous Task Force. Um, so today, today, I won't talk about the part related to Indigenous uh, and, and the relationship with Indigenous regions and peoples. However, I think that um, we do, just to stress that we do have a committee, uh, the CORE Committee at the RIC that keeps on promoting uh, different types of collaborations, and I'll mention a couple of those at the end of the presentation. Retrofits, I think this is probably one of the most important um, issues that we need to dis, um, tackle as architects. In 2017, the CAGBC report on a roadmap to, for retrofits confirmed the critical role that existing buildings retrofits plays in realizing Canada's low carbon future and highlights the potential for Canada to achieve uh, greenhouse gas emissions reductions of at least 30% and further potential to reach a 51% through energy uh, energy retrofit. So this is very important because um, what the data shows we have 80% of our buildings uh, for the next two decades are already built. So we are not building from scratch for everything. So if we really want to tackle the um, uh, carbon emissions from what we have today, well, we really need to think about how do we retrofit buildings. And this is, um, I would say about 80% of the work uh, in terms of uh, tackling climate change as, as architects. 10, the 1.5 uh, degree limit, whereas in 2018, the, internet, uh, the IPCC special report confirmed the catastrophic consequences of current trajectory, uh, trajectory and highlights that bold action over the next 12, now 11 years. So this is aiming for um, 2030. So actually now 10 years will be critical for limiting global heating to 1.5 degrees the threshold necessary to mitigate the most disastrous effects. 11, uh, whereas in 2019, the federal government's assessment report has since found that Canada is warming at twice the global average and up to three times as quickly in the North. So if you remember that map I showed you at the beginning, well, it's actually warming much faster than we are expecting. So. We are looking at a very small window of opportunity right now in the next 10 years to really do something significant to reduce uh, our carbon and to slow down uh, global warming and, um, and in Canada. Uh, 12, uh, related to health. Now, therefore, by be it resolved that commencing in 2019, the RAAC prioritize and support architects to accelerate design for holistic health, resilience, and regener regenerative built environments as a health uh, safety welfare issue through investment in capacity building tools and resource and et cetera. Um, so the RAC wants to invest and, and you know, the RAC is not, um, is a not for profit. So, you know, when we talk about investment, it is, is really about uh, build, uh, building the tools and resources such as educational tools to support architects and uh, people in the, um, the construction industry to develop the strategies uh, to achieve uh, th this design. 13, climate action, be it further resolved that the RAC engage in a multi-year climate action strategy with its full membership, licensing authorities, federal, provincial, and local pol policy makers, schools, other affiliated professional organizations, and the public. The climate action strategy will include education, practice, support, advocacy, and outreach. So, this is how um, you know my involvement with the university and the uh, the REIC kind of comes to play. So, how this uh, as as an educational institute, we can also support this and, uh, as a climate action plan uh, altogether. Uh, the CHOP, the CHOP, be it further resolved that the RIC integrate the paradigm shifts in thought and action required to designing for holistic health, resi resilience, and regenerative built environments into the architect's professional roles and responsibilities and performance standards of its members through the revisions of the Canadian Handbook of Practice. So we call that the CHOP. It's like the book that 
uh, architects need to study to become architects pretty much. Um, it, it defines our, um, our, our profession and uh, how we practice. So the CHOP is published, the last one was, was published in 2009 and it's being revised this year. Um, so we do want a lot of these ideas related to how we design for climate change to be reflected in this so that the new generation of architects also adopt uh, these ideals. The terms, uh, be it further resolved that the RIC revise the terms of reference for all its, all its awards, prizes, and listings to include holistic health, resilience, and regenerative uh, built environments. So, you know, I won't stress too much about this, but um, in terms of how we uh, give awards or prizes or um, uh, credit to architects in the field, well, of course, this idea of holistic health, resilience, and regenerative built environments becomes one of the main criteria moving forward. Policy be res uh, resolved that the RAC support members in the design and delivery of inclusive, ethical, effective, holistic health, resilience, and regenerative, uh, regenerative built environments by revising internal positions and policy st statements. So all of the um, policy that revolves around how we operate the RAC will also include uh, climate equity and ecological health. So uh, related to all of, all of the committees as well. And finally, the last part talks about funding, be it further resolved that the RAC prioritize allocation of funding and resources to support the above. So, you know, in the last year, we've revised a lot of this so that the RAC does become a uh, collaborator and partner in, uh, in, in climate change um, action. So these are the 17 resolutions of the RAIC. So I wanted to present you this so that um, <clears throat> everyone here who are or not part of the RAIC has an, an idea of what the RAIC and the architectural profession as a whole are doing to move uh, um, the climate change um, pro portfolio forward. Um, so next, uh, the last learning uh, objective that we wanted to address in this presentation is, so what are the actions for architects? You know, what is the responsibility and the role of architects when it comes to um, addressing the issue of climate change? In here, I've picked four, just so that it makes it um, focused and we know what we're doing. So if, if we had to pick four uh, actions to take as architects today with the situation and everything that we've listed above, these are the four that I would say are the most pressing. Number one, to commit to the 2030 net zero um, targets. And that means that pretty much every new building that we design today will have to be a green building at a minimum but aiming um, net zero energy, net zero carbon, um, ideally. And even better if you can achieve net positive, but that's very difficult in, in Canada because of our cold weather. Number two, adapt and retrofit. Like I said, 80% of, of our buildings are already built. How do we take those buildings and improve them so that they become energy efficient um, enough. And a lot of that has to do with, well, thinking about how we improve the building envelope, for example. A lot of the old buildings uh, are deteriorating and the, the, the building envelope was not designed to uh, that level of performance. And of course, the uh, mechanical systems of, of how we heat and how we cool buildings. So how do we adapt our old buildings to the standard of um, modern green building uh, standards. Number three, low carbon materials to look for uh, materials that have low intrinsic uh, carbon. And to, um, you know, a lot, a lot of talk has been around uh, mass timber th these days as a better altern alternative to concrete. You know, those kind of discussions, those kind of choices will be crucial in moving forward. And number four, renewable energy. And how do we um, shift from fossil fuels 
to clean energies. And, and this is a difficult um, topic to talk about, especially in Alberta. A couple of, a couple of weeks ago, um, to further this discussion, uh, we had a round table at the REIC Alberta chapter in Calgary. So um, architects and architectural professionals who are based in, in Calgary, um, we asked them the question that we had just talked about to talk about, well, as Alberta, Albertan architects, what would be the main issues that we should tackle here? And I, I picked up a few as takeaways here. Number one, um, collaboration between architects and businesses and economy. Um, you know, one of the main struggles that we have as architects in Alberta is how do we convince that green building or sustainable architecture development is, is good business? Um, number two, positive discussions with the oil and gas industry. How do we shift from fossil fuel based industry to a clean energy with Alberta's economy so tightly knit with the oil and gas? Shifting uh, to re renewable energies. Uh, focus on affordable housing. And we talked about population earlier, but we have a, a situation in Alberta where we don't have enough affordable housing, population is increasing. And, um, you know, how do we deal with that? Uh, retrofitting and conversion of abandoned buildings, especially pertinent today with uh, the COVID situation, we have a lot of uh, empty buildings. So how do we re repurpose them? Or how do we retrofit them? Uh, advocate, advocate and educate clients about benefits of green buildings. So it's not just the architects um, uh, who are uh, advocating, but the art, the clients have to understand uh, it as well so that they ask um, for it. And, and, and we also need the support from the government uh, with the incentives of, of um, uh, developing green buildings. Uh, expanding education and training of sustainably as a whole. So at the university, and this is along with a lot of um, students who think that, well, there's a problem in our education that does not teach about sustainability. So we're revising a lot of the curriculum at the universities and at the college levels to try to include the, um, expand the knowledge of sustainability as a whole. And then uh, finally, adaptability and flexibility of buildings. So I'm just gonna go through quickly to um, one project so that just to give you an idea of what I have done, what I've been doing in the last 10 years of my career. So like I said, designing for climate change has to do with two things. One is mitigation and one is adaptation. Mitigation means, well, how do we stop climate change from happening? How can we design buildings that have um, low impacts on the environment. So this, of course, we talk about green buildings, sustainable buildings, uh, low carbon, clean energy, all of that good stuff is part of mitigation. So we want to stop the 1.5 or the two degrees from happening. So all of that design thinking has to come in mitigation. Then we have this whole other circle that's adaptation um, thinking of, well, if the disaster happens, climate change happens, we have more floods, we have more fires, we have more drought, how do we design for those situations? And that's two kind of circles that are um, interlinked and we need to think uh, on both spectrums. Um, this is a model developed by the AIA on, well, how do we design for resilience? And resilience is defined um, with regards to how quickly a building or a city recovers from a disaster. So here you see the disaster happening and you have four kind of uh, quadrants starting from response, then you have recovery, preparedness and mitigation and you kind of like come back in the loop because you're preparing yourself for the next disaster to happen. Um, some images of this in my uh, own practice uh, when the earthquake happened in Japan in 2011, uh, we had to go quickly to respond to 
um, the situation on the site. Um, most of it was to clean up the debris. A lot of the infrastructure was, of course, the roads and the electricity was down. Um, so dealing with the uh, lifelines and then coming up with designs for temporary housing like shelters to accommodate people who are displaced from their homes. Then we have the recovery phase where um, it's more of a citizen participation. You need to talk to the community to think about, well, how do we rebuild? Do we rebuild exactly the same way because of, of the identity of a place? Uh, can it be designed the, exactly the same way? Or shall it be um, completely rethought in terms of thinking about um, uh, stronger infrastructure or stronger uh, structure around the buildings? So, you know, recovery is about rethinking the process. Preparation. So thinking about, well, let's say we talk about earthquakes. Well, if there's another earthquake coming up again, uh, can we prepare for that? And can our buildings be stronger in terms of structural, uh, structurally stronger or prepare for floods uh, and so on? And finally, mitigation to come up with the new, um, the new guidelines, the new rules in terms of how we use and how we adapt these buildings. And this, this presentation in particular I had prepared for an audience in South Korea in 2015. And that's when they had the MERS outbreak, the Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome. So it's kind of eerie that we're in this um, COVID pandemic today and we're still talking about that. But I think this is you know, uh, the same situation that, that repeats in, sense, in the sense that if we have a pandemic today, we need to prepare for the next wave or the next, um, the next uh, cycle of disasters. So just one project that I had done in uh, Indonesia after an earthquake and a tsunami, uh, we had developed a, a new hospital that was designed with green, um, green building design in, in mind. And the inspiration was these um, ant mounds, uh, sorry, the termite mounds. And these termite mounds, you know, they function very interestingly um, is that they have these water pits on the bottom and with the tubes of air that come into the mounds, it's evaporated, uh, e the evaporative cooling through these um, channels uh, provided with uh, natural ventilation. So we tried to imitate this in our project in Indonesia. So this project is two things. One, it was designed um, to, uh, as, a, as an adaptation building after the earthquake and tsunami in, in Jakarta, uh, in Indonesia, in the area of Sumatra. So we rebuilt this hospital, but at the same time, we thought about, well, what can we bring to the building to incorporate it as a green building. So all of the techniques of uh, green roofs, um, solar panels, recycling water. So the, the two circles that we showed you earlier, one of mitigation and one of adaptation, we tried to bring everything to this one project. And this was the final uh, project that was completed in 2012. So just to finish my presentation, I know that we are uh, at the last few minutes. So um, just an invitation to a couple of things that we are doing at the RAIC. Uh, members of, our, of the RAIC have come up with several platforms to address the issue of climate change. The first one is uh, RISE. RISE for Architecture is a platform uh, for discussion between architects and the general public uh, on, on, on issues of not just climate change, but uh, architecture, built environment in general. Um, recently, we talk a lot about equity and um, with the issue of uh, Black Lives Matter, for example, how do we talk about race uh, in, in architecture is also within this platform of discussion. So if you're interested to uh, connect with us on RISE, uh, you can look us up on, online. Architects Declare is also an initiative that was started by members of the RAC that um, 
about architects who have uh, come forward to take action on these uh, issues related to climate change in particular. So we've uh, hosted several forums uh, and discussion panels related to that. And finally, an invitation. Um, a couple of days ago, uh, there was a conversation on climate change that happened uh, online. And uh, this is in preparation to next year's World Architecture Day. So two days ago, we talked about it being the World Architecture Day. Uh, next year, it's gonna be on October 4th. And we're hoping if COVID permitting, we will have a, um, a Congress on architecture that addresses again on the issue of climate action. So if, if you're interested in that, uh, mark your calendars for next year. So my final thought is, well, what is the responsibility of architects? Uh, with regards to designing for climate change. So the planet, if we think about it as a building or our home, uh, the stance we should take is, well, how should we actually, how should we be designing it or saving it? So that's uh, it for me, Jody. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Sang. That was super interesting. Uh, we've got a couple of questions. Uh, we are a little short on time, so I will be try and be quick with these. Um, the first question could open up a whole ream of debate, uh, so uh, we'll ask it anyway, and we'll go for a quick answer, and hopefully that satisfies uh, everyone. Um, so from Andrew, is population really the problem, or is it the expectation of certain ways of living, for example, that we can fly around the world on a whim. Absolutely, you're right. I think there there are two ways to see this. Number one is the sheer numbers. You know, we are expected to double, all, you know, forty percent increase in the next thirty years. So we are struggling with well, how do we design infrastructure around that? You know, we need not just buildings. We need the infra infrastructure, the transportation. Cities will become sprawled. We're looking at you know one New York City every week almost in terms of increase. So that's one thing. But I think, like you say, the level of comfort that we've come to enjoy. And if everyone wants to have a big house, and one of the problems is, well, do we need you know um, detached housing? Does every family needs to have a separate house, and we don't share? You know, there's no density and it becomes more and more sprawled. Well, that's also a very big problem. And I think that's one of the biggest problems in the US, for example, where, you know, cities are very, very sprawled and there's not much density. So you're right. I think we've come to enjoy a level of comfort um, that comes with a lot of energy use, especially if now we have, you know, I have two laptops on right now with my cell phone and the TV and, you know, everyone has four portable devices now and everyone needs to charge it every day. So we're looking at energy use like we've never seen it before. And if we look at energy modeling today, you know, before we would say, well, the fridge is what's eating up a lot of your energy. And then you also have the lights and you have the heating and cooling of the building, but plug loads, whatever you plug in your um, plugs today, is way more significant than it was 10, 20 years ago. So that needs to be th thought of. And I think that's really um, behavior, behavioral in terms of how we, um, we live as, as humans. Great answer. Thank you, Henry. And the final question from Lori. Uh, what is the architect's responsibility to bring the discussion of green building innovation to their clients? For example, if you have a client who has no interest in helping achieve the 2030 net zero target and the profession has established these resolutions, how do you proceed with that particular client? Wow, that's a, a very good question. I don't know if I can answer properly, but we had this discussion at the round table uh, two weeks ago. So one, architects, I don't believe are the best positioned in this because we are hired as providing a service. So of course, we can lay the plan of this. However, when it comes to the client, of course, um, budget becomes one of the biggest issues. So 
up to today, I think um, many, the impression of green buildings is that one, it's more expensive upfront. So if you design a building according to what we usually do, and then we build another building according to green building standards, the cost will generally be higher. Um, and the cost depends on what kind of technologies that and how far you go. Um, but we're looking at a you know 10% to 30% increase in initial cost of the budget of the project. But then when we come to the table with the client and talk about green buildings, well, let's talk about you know sustainability, then architects need to be a lot more proficient in terms of explaining life cycle cost. You know, we're looking at buildings 50 years, 100 years, and let's say you save 10% of energy, 20% of energy every month. Well, in the long run, you are saving money. And, you know, the ethical part, of course, really is not for us, us to preach, but I think if we want to convince um, uh, a client on uh, to come on board on doing a green building, uh, architects need to be more professional and talk about life cycles, how long the building is going to be used. We're also not very good at talking about, um, we're not very good at talking about um, the mechanical issues surrounding the building, like the technical issues of uh, energy usage, water, water usage, you know, architects were, are not trained with the technical background to dive into calculations of, well, how much energy are you actually saving? So we do need to collaborate with the engineers a lot to, to come up with the data. But to come up with a plan that talks about life cycles, and if I expand that answer a little bit to, for example, office buildings, green buildings are more healthy for the person who uses it. So we talk about, if we talk about green buildings to a, a commercial uh, client, then the issue of health for the employees translate to productivity, right? If we say, well, if you design a green building, your employees are healthier and they'll work, work harder uh, and be more productive, well, that's also an added value to that project. So there's many ways to kind of spin it. However, um, I think architects need to be um, more proficient in it. Okay, perfect. Thank you, Dr. Thang. Um, I think that's pretty much it from us today. Um, I want to thank everyone uh, for joining us these past few weeks. And if you're a regular to these webinars, you'll remember that when you close down your uh, webinar today, uh, a, you're going to be prompted by a survey that will pop up. If you could please take five minutes out of your day to uh, answer the questions within the survey, it's really going to help the Biosphere Institute to uh, understand how effective we've been at uh, helping you learn things today and also it will help us uh, gather information that we can use to apply for additional funding to continue uh, putting on events like this into the future so your help is very much appreciated. Um, and finally, one more huge thank you to everyone who's attended uh, any and all of the sessions. Um, if you missed any of the webinars, um, we do host them currently on the Biosphere Institute's YouTube page, and we are working very hard on switching them onto our website. Um, we also still have uh, live online the Sustainable Building Summit Showcase, uh, where you can contact some of these companies doing things that have been talked about today and, and speak to some of these engineers and, and so on and so forth um, with their direct details online. Um, so thank you again, everyone, and please do have a great fall. Uh, enjoy the colors while they last before the snow comes. Um, one more time, thank you, Dr. Henry Thang, for an very interesting presentation uh, and I wish everyone the best. Thanks for joining us. Thanks a lot, Jody. Thanks everyone for coming today.